Well, welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Bryce. Hello there, Robbie. Bryce, good afternoon to you, good sir. Good, good. It's good morning here. Oh, it's morning still over there? It is indeed, yes. And, Aren't and, yeah. Time good zones speaking. just the best thing in the world to try and figure out. Some people are five hours apart. Some people are like a whole day apart. And then like, I think in Australia, it's like nighttime over there. So they'll be like, oh, you mean Tuesday? I'm like, no, I mean Monday. They're like, no, that's Tuesday, our time. I'm like, why can't we all just focus on one thing? And then that's just, we love each other. We just got to love. <laughs> Absolutely. You have to love, don't you? All you need is love. That's all you need. Well, Bryce, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself, brother? I'm a historian, Robbie. Um, So I specialize in the politics, the history and politics of food these (laughs) days. See, all right. So coming at it as a person that would have just heard you say you're a historian about what I say, food. Someone would be like, what would you have to learn about food? Because obviously pizzas from Italy and then tacos are from Mexico. Actually, food has probably one of the weirdest histories. And it's one that I've done a little bit of podcasting about. Um, my favorite's cornflakes, how that was invented, which a lot of people don't know was invented to prevent masturbation. That sounds like such a fake news article. But then you read it and you're like, Okay, let's put ourselves in the mindset of someone that just created a bland cereal with no sugar on it, no Lucky Charms, no marshmallow little puff things to make you smile in the middle of the night. You're eating regular bran flakes, good for the fiber. Also, there's no sugar, and they thought sugar led to your passions increasing and that you'd be just masturbating all over the place. First of all, Before this conversation, I had eggs and I had raisin bran, and I don't feel like touching myself at all. (laughs) Well, congratulations, uh, because, you know, as Henry Kellogg, as he says, you know, and a good, good, you know, God-fearing man, and uh, he thought that, um, you know, I suppose this is because that link between diet and, and life and outlook was starting to be made at that time, but I think Kellogg goes the extra mile there in uh, trying to prevent masturbation through uh, cornflakes. Um, whether he was successful or not, I'm not sure. Your, your experience would tend to suggest otherwise. Um, if you've had eggs this morning and raisin bran and you are still not horny, then um, maybe Mr. Kellogg got it wrong. I want to know when that was invented, if there was just like this implication of starting to give kids cornflakes in school, like in, in like their pu- pubescent years, I would say, when they're starting to hit that, you know, you got one foot door or I guess one foot in the door of puberty. And it's like, why are they starting to feed us cornflakes? Like, this is really weird. It's like the teacher's like, we just don't want to masturbate. And they're at their sexual prowess right now. It's it's really weird to see how it all shifts and works. I love talking about diet trends because you'll either see someone talk about like all meat or all vegan, or I'm like, you it, you find what works for you. And everyone, I mean, back in the day was so obsessed with the Adkins diet trend. They were like, Adkins, Adkins is the best, Adkins is the best. And they're like, but didn't he die? I'm like, yeah, he slipped and <laughs> fell and busted his head open on ice. So I'm like, look, and people were yelling at him saying that Adkins died because of his diet. And I'm like, no. Everyone is trying to pinpoint on what works as the key hole. And honestly, it's just the fact of it works if it works. You can be really good with meat, be really good with vegetables. But a diet of bran flakes, who's to say that's bad? I've eaten that for 20-something years, and I'm perfectly okay besides not being able to poop ever. (laughs) (laughs) Well, like I say, around that time, um, people think that dietary fads are just a new thing, like you say. I mean, it's highly ironic, isn't it? Uh, that your man falls over and kills himself after subjecting us to this pretty austere diet. And another one that was around at the time of Kellogg, have you heard of Horace Fletcher or Fletcherism? Fletcherism? Fle- Fletcherism, and he's writing it at the, around the same time as Kellogg, and he's an American dietitian author. And his big idea, and this was all the rage in late 19th century, early 20th century America, Britain, was that you had to masticate. Now I said masticate, not, not the other word masticate more uh, to properly get the, the digestive juices going. So that Fletcher said that if you're taking a mouthful of anything, be it your, your, your raisin uh, brekkie or whatever, you have to chew and chew and chew and chew and chew until it's really essentially broken down into just liquids and only then can you swallow. And that was supposed to be a lot better for you uh, because you're getting the, the proper digestive juices into you. I mean, it's, it's a lot of it. I mean, yeah, you should chew your food well, but he's, he's, he's recommending chewing you know, with every mouthful like a hundred times 
And this is incredibly popular, but it's also nonsense. I mean, you really don't have to chew stuff that much, but it I just would, goes to show. I would only recommend that if you're at a steakhouse, because I feel like the only food I've ever really choked on was a steak. Like you just don't cut it all the way. Then like part of it's in your mouth and then part of it's down your throat and it's stuck together by that nice little string wire where it's like, I mean, if you have to, if you own a steakhouse, all the waitresses and waiters are required to know CPR. So I'm like, Already, I'm away from that food. It doesn't make any sense to me of why you'd want to die. Oh, I had a porterhouse. And then you you choke and die. It doesn't make any sense. But, I mean, it makes sense chewing your food. But honestly, even the whole trend of, uh, you have to eat and then wait 30 minutes to go swimming. I never did that in my life. I've never got a cramp while I was swimming. I'm in the water. You ever heard of just floating? There's a reason why we're buoyant as people. If you get a cramp, just lay on your back. You'll float. It, it It's this whole shift of things. I mean, the advancements that you've seen our society progress to, much of my fascination with like, you know, the ancient pyramids or something, I was really fascinated with how people back in the day were eating bread and grinding their teeth down because you would think, bread? Why, why would why would bread grind your teeth down? Well, it was a mix of things. Either they'd get sand in it. Like, have you ever had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or whatever on a beach and then you somehow get sand in it and you're like how did this even happen i didn't drop it like sand mom, gets everywhere sand, yeah. sand will get everywhere and anywhere and, and again it's come back to body parts it will get absolutely everywhere as you as you know i'm sure i i live in a beach town trust me i'm not i'm not too short of the uh the the swim trunk game let me tell you <laughs> But when it comes to eating that food, they were grinding their teeth down with a mix of the grindstone that they were making the bread with would also get inside of their bread, but they would just turn it into rubble. And then at the same time, even with sand in Egypt, they would get bread or they would get sand in their food all the time. And then we made amazing discoveries using salt to preserve our food because we didn't have freezer technology back then. Mm. I mean, the vast advancements to it. Are you more excited or i guess interested in the fact of how far we have come or more on the fact of all these foods have a really weird history yeah i'm fascinated in the in the sort of technology of food and food preservation and um i'm going to do a shameless book plug here i've got this new book out which is about the history of airline food and the technology the science behind how your airline meal evolves is absolutely fascinating as is the history of stuff that you mentioned preservation Refrigeration, you know, refrigeration in, in the 19th century, if you think about it, it changes the world, it changes the world in terms of global trade, how you're able to preserve food, how you're able to serve food. I mean, people just don't realize that food technology is so important. And, you know, com coming back to airline food, you know, it, 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 I think it has an, a bad rap. It, it, you know, it's got a bad name, airline food. But actually, when you think about the scientific challenges behind serving a meal in the air seven miles high, I think airline food can be pretty good. All right. So when you sent me that message saying you want to talk about airline food, this is something I've had a very bad experience in, mostly because I went on a trip to Hawaii, which was like a 12 hour flight. So for like eight hours of that flight, they just played fucking Shark Tank, where if I see Mark, what is his name, Rubio, whatever his name is, if I see his face, I just immediately get nauseous. But I remember the waitress came around and she's like, what would you like to eat? And I was like, oh, what do you have? And she's like, you can get a chicken or the fish. And I'm like, chicken or the fish? Damn. I'm like, um, can I get the chicken? She goes, no, we don't have the chicken. We're all out. Would you like the fish? And I'm like, sure. She goes, okay, I'll go in the back. She goes into the back and the fish is out too. So she comes back and she's like, we're out of both. And I'm like, well, how long do we have left in the flight? She's like two hours. I'm like, so I'm starving. What is there to eat? She's like, um, I can see if we can get you some peanuts or something. And I ate, no, 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 no. You're thinking peanuts, like planters peanuts. No, 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 no. I ate the fucking airplane, airplane brand peanuts. And I had 12 bags. And honestly, I love that over the chicken. That looked way more appetizing than my cousin who was enjoying chicken right beside me. I well, was like, I, if, if I can just defend their line, but some people, you know, they, they had this thing at the end of the, the cold war. In, uh, in Berlin, you know, when the Berlin Wall comes down. And everyone in East Berlin, it's referred to as, as uh, Berlin Wall Syndrome. Suddenly they've been living in a communist country where you go to the supermarket and you know there's one brand of everything. Suddenly they're presented with what we're used to in the Western world, about 10 brands of everything. And people just couldn't cope because they're just like, this is too much choice. There is such a thing as having too much choice. So I personally quite like it when they come around and say, 
chicken or fish. It's a restriction of choice, which I think is great. Then I again, don't, you, I don't, you I'm not against, offer. I'm not against that at all. I just wish if you knew you were out of the fucking food, don't offer it up on the table. That's like me saying, here's a thing of, uh, here's a million dollars, but you can't have it. And it's just sitting in front of you. You're like, well, why would you even bring that into my perspective view? I mean, I was okay with the peanuts. They weren't bad. I tore through like 12 bags, but it's just the fact of like the principle, like just don't, don't, don't put that. Just bring another ginger ale and walk away. Just bring it. She's teasing you. I think Robbie, she's teasing you. Uh, But peanuts as well. Again, fascinating history there. Why, why do airlines always chuck peanuts at you? Well, yeah, it's because it's, you know, it's a cheap snack, but also when they started doing the first experimentations with men in space, they found out that just, just number one, the salt, but number two, the calming ritual of chewing. It's, it's a calming factor. It calms you down. It, it, whether you're in space or in an aircraft, just chewing is, is the way to go. And the earliest astronauts in the American space program, they give them peanuts all the time just to calm them down. It's kind of like bar food where like they give you those salty snacks because it makes you even more, or I guess what well, it gets you the ability to drink more. Like you soak up some of that alcohol, which makes you want to drink more. So you'll spend more money. It's kind of like a mind thing. Yeah, I mean, when you think about bar snacks as well, and you think about the, the good old, bad old days when you literally had, and I'm sure it's the same over there, where you have, you know, you would have had back, you know, a bowl of peanuts or pretzels like on the bar for, for everyone. And you think about the health concerns today about touching anything. And you know, these studies that go to show that whenever you've got those big bowls, which everyone can dip into, all the many different types of urine, et cetera, that they find, they, they, you know, did. Did, was that ever a thing that you could you, you just had a you know a communal uh, sort of bowl of peanuts or sandwiches just laid out like in the yeah box? but i never thought about everybody's urine soaked hands going for it i mean yeah. i was at fault at sometimes for rushing out of the bathroom without washing my hands i'll admit to that so i mean as long as you're not double dipping i don't see it as a crime i just try not to think about it like you can you can throw yourself through a loophole if you start going where has my food came from which is like what's going on so this is a theory i tossed out a long time ago why people are so obsessed with like food review pages and all these food pages that are on instagram it's because you want to watch somebody eat it because you secretly deep down want to eat it, but you don't want the effects of what happens after you eat it, such as the calories. It's a bunch of people like, oh my God, I'm getting satisfaction off of watching them consume something, which is why it's so interesting. It's like when you watch somebody open up a baseball card pack or a Pokemon card pack online, there's a whole bunch of people that are like, oh, like they just like feel like they're going to, you know, I think, some right. I think it's like vicarious enjoyment. And, and again, book plug number two coming up. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, I talk about this in the, at the start of the book, right? This idea of this, these days we have this idea, which you just alluded to there, food porn, if you like, you know, p- people taking pictures on their phones of their food. I think with airline food, there's, there's three or four websites entirely dedicated to bad airline food. And it's kind of like a reverse food porn. It's like, look at how bad my meal was. In fact, you could have gone on there and said, look, I didn't even get a meal. That's the kind of thing. It's this sort of reverse food porn. How bad can my airline meal be? And that's given airline food a bad reputation. You don't, Uh, you shouldn't expect to go on an airplane expecting that type of service. If you're that pissed off to write a bad review on like the airline didn't have my lobster rolls. It's like, no, you're going, it's, it, it's, a, it's like being in your car. You don't expect there to be snacks. You don't expect there to be things. You pack that stuff for the trip. Every time I went on an airline, I wasn't expecting a five course meal. I wasn't even expecting a meal. My pissed off part was when you offer me something and then you don't have it. I'm like, then why did you offer? I was contempl- I could air feed. I'd be okay. But then you toss that shrimp or you toss that chicken or fish in my head. Next thing you know, I'm sucking down peanuts. Like, I don't know. Like, like I'm an elephant at a zoo. It's like when people go these days, people want to review everything. Now I can understand that. Say you're going to stay in a hotel or something or a restaurant. It's quite interesting sometimes to read reviews, but now with TripAdvisor, et cetera, people review anything. So there's stuff like, you know, national parks, mountains, you know, there, there was one I was looking at the other day, a mountain range in, in Wales near where I live, Mount, Mount Snowden, one of the most beautiful mountain ranges in, uh, in Britain. And, and the big mountain there is Mount Snowden. And someone's reviewed that on TripAdvisor and given it like two stars or average. 
What? How on earth? What are you doing? How are you? Neil, you're, Neil, you're deGrasse, doing Neil deGrasse Tyson talked about this. There's people that are, have reviewed stars in space. And it's like, how are you reviewing something that is so complex that we barely even understand? And it's just the fact of we just want to toss opinions out there. We think that they matter so highly that someone's going to see it and be like, well, first of all, any review I see on a movie, I go the complete opposite way that that person has reviewed it because every movie I love, people hate. And it's the same thing. You got to make your own decisions in life. The only funny reviews I've ever seen have been like reviews for Hairbow gummy bears, the sugar free ones. If you want to talk about a weird food history, look up that sucker. Everyone who's eaten the sugar free Hairbow gummy bears has had an explosion out of their ass. And that is because of I'm, I'm serious. Look it up on Amazon. There's about 50,000 reviews of everyone just going, I don't know what life is anymore. I think the top <laughs> review was some dude talking about. I ate this, and then an hour later, my ass exploded like Mount St. Helens. Well, it's, it, it serves them right, Robbie, for going for sugar-free. I mean, come on. Look, if you're eating sweets, just go for sugar for goodness sake. And who'd be eating sugar-free Haribo, for goodness sake? It's like people that want chocolate cake, but they don't want the icing on top. They're still getting the chocolate cake, but like, oh, it's less calories. And it's like, that's not... It's not how the game is played, my friend. Exactly. We all have friends who, you know, will... will I, I would call it virtue signaling. Now I've got no nothing against anyone who's, who's living healthy life, healthy diet. Absolutely, hundred percent fair play to you. But you know the sort of friends who are the sort of virtue signalers. So you go to a restaurant and you're having maybe you know a, a bit of booze and a good feed, and they they'll just get the salad option. But then they'll drench it in salad cream, in, in mayonnaise, in garnish, which See, is just as that's, bad. That's me. Besides the mayo. I don't do any dressings on my salad. I'm a clean eater because I'm a fitness freak. So I've, I always, I just lost the taste for like really special good stuff. My little secret now, right now, because everybody has their weakness to something. If I smell a Domino's pizza, fuck me. That is a, that is a, that is a game changer. If I smell that oregano on the crust, oh, you better take that pizza away from me. But frozen animal crackers, I've been freezing them, having like one or two a day. I mean, it helps get that sweet craving because your body is craving nutrients. And as much as you can stick to bland food, which I've done for the past eight years of my life, every day, the same meal, you find ways to spice it up. Cumin, um, paprika, whatever you want to do, you find your way to change the game. Which Wait, hang on. You, you're you eating the same meal every day, the same dish every day in your life, you say. What, yeah. what is that dish? It's a uh, can of tuna. Sometimes I'll put chicken in it, but mostly a can of tuna and a salad. Wow. I, I, I do. Oh, and I use uh, cereal as croutons. So I'll take a handful of cereal and I'll put it on top of my salad. Wow. And is that, but this is part of your healthy living regime. Well, I've worked out every day. So that's just been the diet. I know what, uh, how many calories are in tuna, how much protein I need to consume. And then I've just eaten that. I like it too. I mean, besides eating eggs or something, um, egg whites, but like, that's about it. Mostly can of tuna. I mean, I'm, I'm not, like I said, a lot of people go and want the whole chef experience, want this whole thing. It's not in everybody's wheelhouse. Some people just want to, you know, get the meal done with and then move on to the next task. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. But I mean, don't you get tired of tuna? Don't you try and mix it up a bit of different types of fish or I don't know, throw a bit of mackerel in there or something? Just I don't know. I'm a variety. really big proprietor of tuna. My doctor's like, you have mercury poisoning. I'm like, so what's the fix? He's like, just stop eating tuna. I'm like, I don't want to do that. Like, I, I, I'm okay with what, what's the side effects? He's like depression, hair loss, uh, fatigue. And I'm like, all right. I mean, I'm experiencing all that. So if this is as worse as it gets, I'm okay with eating the tuna. Well, look, there you go. I mean, you know, there, there's so many ailments that can, you can suffer from these days, isn't there? But what about airline food, though? Because that really struck my nerve. I was like, what does he mean airline food? What's the misconceptions? Are you so you're supporting them. So what is the what what I'm is kind the of supporting? Well, like you said earlier on that you, and you're quite right. Yeah, why should you, you know, these days? Because I don't know about you, but usually if I'm flying for business or research, you try and source just the cheapest flight possible, really, to get from A to B. But back in the, but you know, that's the kind of marketplace we're living in now where you don't really expect, you, you're, our expectations are low. But in this book, I'm looking at how back in the day, I mean, back in the day when not a lot of people flew, when it was essentially wealthy white guys and the technology wasn't great. I mean, they had basically sort of butlers on board who would, and back then, of course, 
Flying was more of a hop on, hop off experience. It wasn't long haul. So you had to stop off maybe after an hour to refuel, et cetera. And these guys called purses were basically butlers would hop off the plane, go to the local market, source food, prepare it, bring it back on, on board and serve it up. And because they're flying at such low altitudes, afterwards, any debris, they just literally chuck it out the back of the plane. It's incredible. Um, but they, they kind of took a lot of care and attention. And then that happens if you go, go on into the 1950s, airlines start collaborating with Michelin star chefs, like professional chefs, the best chefs in the world from Parisian restaurants. And airline food gets really good. I think it starts to really decline uh, probably by the 80s and 90s when it's like a lot more competition, a lot more no cheap, no frills carriers coming in. Before that, I think probably 50s to 70s, Airline food was good. And like you say, you know, you're not expecting five courses. Well, back in the day, if you were flying first class on, on Pan American, you were, you were going to get eight courses served from a rolling cart accompanied by a wine and a liqueur with every plate. Don't uh, you think that correlates? Well, don't you think that correlates, though, with the fact that airline food flying, all those types of stuff, it was very new back then. So you want to bring these high course meals out and you want to get fresh food. So people are like, oh my God, it's an, it's like a vacation in the sky. We're going on this giant flying, th- contra- that's what it is. Like as soon as you open up a store, it's always all this, oh my God, the, they open up a pizzeria or something. The pizza is amazing. Ah, and then after like a couple of years, they're like, well, it's okay. It wasn't as good as when they first started because you get used to it. It's like, all right, we're already in the market. You're impressing everybody by, hey, look at this new thing. You can fly somewhere, but it's also like a, a vacation. It's a getaway. You get to go on a giant metal plane, fly in the sky that is oxygen is being pumped through it. There's always a crying baby on there and you're getting served a high course meal, which is like going to the movies. You know, it's an adventure. It's a trip. But then after a while, it just wasn't the priority anymore with the competition. Now it's all about do you have the new episode or new edition of Sky Mall? Do you have a TV on the back of the airplane? Everything kind of went down to the wayside yeah. where the only thing you're really expecting from the airline when food wise is the drink that comes around to you. Well, yeah, that's the thing. And I suppose today you're right. There's so many more audio visual distractions. You know, people are glued to the movies, et cetera, the music. I mean, imagine back in the day, you didn't have that. And you're right. It was a novelty. So you had to fill the whole experience with lavish food you know that became a sort of absolute selling point but there's a there's a fascinating episode um called the sandwich war i don't know if you've ever heard about this in the aviation industry in the 1950s there was this thing called the sandwich war whereby a lot of the american airlines were getting really annoyed because they they airlines always wanted to have this distinction between first class yeah top dollar customers and your economy class i.e you know the hoi polloi the rest of us and they want economy class to be restricted to cold food, so crapper food, sandwiches, that kind of thing. Not the hot, really well prepared, several courses food you get in first class. It's costing too much money. But what the European competition starts to, especially the Scandinavians, those damn Scandinavians, they start Scandinavian Airlines SAS start serving really good food in economy. And they stick by the ruling that it has to be cold, but they're serving all those lovely sort of open sandwiches, really well garnished on rye bread with salad, with lots of different meat, cold cuts, really, really nice sandwiches. And the American Airlines get really annoyed. They take a case to the international uh, regulator, say you, you can't be serving food that this is good, that is this good in economy. And they actually win the case. But it's kind of a pyrrhic victory because people realize, well, hang on, food in economy can be quite good. And winning that sandwich war bizarrely makes the American characters go, well, actually, you know, we should serve good food in the economy. We shouldn't just be chucking peanuts to people. And they start to introduce actually really good hot food in the economy, including stuff like, you know, you've told me your horror experience of actually having no food on a plate. Imagine back in the day they were serving stuff like, uh, you know, coco van or stuffed guinea hen prepared by a Parisian chef to economy class customers. It's like, it's just another world. I think if you really care so much about what you're getting on an airplane for food, it's probably because you travel a lot. Like a lot of businessmen that go on planes every single day probably are the ones to leave reviews like, hey, but then that's when you pick your specific airline. Like mm-hmm. if you're going on fucking Delta, you're not expecting a five star lobster or something like that. You're expecting the base rummage of shit. So if for an average 
passenger, it's going to be like, I just, we're taking a vacation. It's our once in a year vacation. Food's not really going to matter a whole lot. It might play a factor if you're like, well, the trip was pretty cool. The plane ride sucked. There was like crappy food. Yeah. Okay. Whatever. But if you're a businessman traveling, I can see where that would be the point. You know what I mean? You pick, you would end up figuring out what airlines sell the best type of food. Like, oh, did you know Southwest? They give out packaged peanuts, but they're not just regular peanuts. They're seasoned peanuts. It's like it's like a, a traditional Cajun style peanut. And it's like this whole inside thing. Like sometimes the water is clearer. There's less minerals in it. So it tastes better. They learn those inside tricks. But for the general public, like I just don't see that even being if you're that worried about your food on an airplane, what else do you got going on in your life? Like you got to have some excitement. That just seems like a, a like a uphill battle. Like, why are you going to try and attack that? Well, true, yeah, especially as they, they, they found this out in history that you know, when you're seven miles high in the sky, like you said before, you know, cabin pressure, altitude, uh, lack of humidity, it actually desensitizes your taste buds. That's why a lot of uh, airline food is you know, drenched in sauces. It's quite rich, quite salty a lot of the time, because if you serve stuff that's a bit blander, you can't taste it because your taste buds are so numb. That sounds like some fake news with like, oh, the quality of air is different. So your food's going to taste different. I'm like, that just gives you an excuse to feed me shit. Like, I, just be <laughs> honest. You're on it. If I was a stewardess and someone says, but I want a Cinnabon. I'm like, you're in a fucking airplane. You're going to Tahiti. Shut the fuck up until we get there. Like what? What? It's not a, it's not a big thing for me to want to do that. I'm more worried about the, the air oxygen tanks in the back of the plane that are pumping in oxygen. If those things explode, I'm worried about if we're going to crash or not. What happens if we hit a thing of ducks? And then uh, next thing you know, what's his name? Uh, Tom Hanks has to take over the fucking airplane. I'm worried about stuff like that rather than where my food's coming from. Put on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and I'll take a nap. I'm okay. Well, you know, I, I talking about Sully and the, this, the image of the pilot, you know, the, the Tom Hanks, Sully, was it Sully was the movie, wasn't it? And this idea of like the, the heroic pilot, um, in, interviewing a lot of former flight attendants, a lot of air hostesses, which I did for this book. A lot of them, uh, I thought they would have great reverence uh, for the pilots, you know, these, these brilliant men keeping everybody safe, carrying out emergency landings when the docks hit the, uh, the, the engines and all this kind of stuff. Well, turns out, no, they actually think that a lot of them are, are kind of dicks. Uh, they had this um, expression, the, the, all the flight attendants called them sky gods. But these guys were really quite patronizing. They thought that they were just like heroic god figures. They're egos. Big, big egos. And I, okay, I can understand that because you've gone through a lot of education, a lot of training, it's, it's high-end stuff. But a lot of the time, and now this is back in the day, I, I'm sure things have changed today, but they were pretty bullying, pretty patronizing to the air hostesses. And one of them told a great story to me, which is now sort of folklore of Pan American, that, that, that great, great American carrier, which is now defunct. It's kind of folklore, so perhaps take it with a pinch of salt. But there was a story that one of these pilots was uh, incredibly bullying and rude. And he was bullying this one flight attendant just all the time during the flight, kept bullying her, kept bullying her. And back in those days, this would have been the 60s and the 70s, everybody smoking cigarettes on board. So the flight attendants used to always have eye drops with them because otherwise you just get red eye from what you're constantly going through the cabin, all the smoke in your eye. And she worked out that, that these eye drops actually had a big laxative effect. So to get her own back upon this bullying, Sky God, this pilot, she actually, when, when he requested quite rudely, give me my coffee, she went back to the galley, shucked a load of um, eye drops in his coffee and served it to him, which then had a big laxative effect. And instead of flying the plane, again, if you're a nervous flyer, maybe you won't want to hear this story. Uh, he had to rush to the toilet and uh, immediately evacuate his bowels, um, which goes to show that there was these guys a lot of the time could be a bit rude. A uh, bit of, like, say, a bit of a hero complex going on, a bit of an ego. And some of them got their comeuppance because of it. That's why I request to see my pilot. Like, when I get on the airplane, usually the pilot's, like, with the stewardesses as they're as you're entering it. Like, they're waving to you, like, hi, I'm your captain, whatever. I like to meet them 
just like not like a private tour or anything. I just what want to get it. How, when you meet them, what, what do you do? Do you give them a manly handshake? What, why I, you sometimes them? I'll shake their hand depending on if they look like, you know, if they have their hands to their side, I'll reach my hand out for a handshake. Say, nice to meet you. You know, I like to get to know my pilot, make sure I'm in safe hands. If I see an elderly person that looks like they might have a heart attack while we're in air, I just turn off and walk off the flight. I'm like, not nah, I'll fucking take the next one. Like, this isn't a train. You can't just catch the next one. I'm like, I will book another motherfucking flight. I don't care because I'm not going to final destination and die. It's not going to happen today. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, we're, we're all haunted by that first scene. And is it the final, first final destination? Yeah. Or is it the second one? Yeah, it's, it's pretty haunting. But um, yeah, it's, I mean, talk, talking about old people here a little bit, Ill, I was once on a flight. It was Aer Lingus, which is the Irish national carrier, transatlantic flight. It was Dublin to, uh, to New York. And uh, it's the thing you always say in movies like halfway across the Atlantic, the, you know, head uh, stewardess comes on the, the, the system. Is there a doctor on board because we have someone who's taken ill, i.e. an old person was having serious heart palpitations. I don't think it was a full attack. And I had that wonderful moment because uh, like, you know, I, I'm an academic, I'm not a proper doctor. I just, I've got degrees in history, but when they said, is there a doctor on board? For that like 30 seconds, you're just like, oh, yeah, I can, yeah, yeah. And then you realize, no, no, sit down. You're, you're not a real doctor. You might have doctor in your title, but there's no way that you can perform a life-saving role here. Sit back down in your seat and behave yourself. But I did have that brief rush of excitement, Robbie, where I thought, oh, I, hang on, that's me. I could be the hero. I could be the Sully in this story, but but no. The that's like I know that's probably got away on you a little bit. I know it happened to me. Um, in September, a person at my gym had died and they had brought him back to life while I was on shift. And you think about it so much into your head, like, Oh, what's going to happen in that moment? When that moment happened, this man fell off of a stairmaster and hit his head on the floor, like dropped a good like five feet and had a heart attack and he had died. Luckily, there were two nurses on staff that came over, gave him CPR and everything. But it was like that moment I ran up. I didn't know what to do. And then they're like, call 911. And I had to run and call 911. And it was like this whole thing where I felt like I didn't jump into the occasion like I thought I would. Mm. And it happens, but... I like to live by like my grandfather's motto where he's like, you don't, you know, if you have a heart condition, like my grandfather recently had a heart condition to where now he's not okay to fly. Like it's kind of like an, if like 50, 50 chance here, like that, you know, your heart could go out if you get too high up in the sky. And he's just like, that's fine. I didn't want to fucking fly anyway. I'm like, there you go. You mm -hmm. live a motto where it's like, you know, you're not going to put yourself in those dangers just because you want to trip to Tahiti. I mean, it makes sense if you want to travel and stuff, but he, the man's right, man. The man was right. He hated airport security. That's the issue. Fuck yeah, the airplane yeah, food. Yeah. It's the whole take your shoes off all this. I watched my grandfather for 45 minutes scream bitch and complain everything in an airport where it was might have been like 5 a.m or something so there wasn't a whole lot of people there but my grandma just standing there like he always does this and he's like well, i gotta take my fucking belt off and then my shoes and then they start waving a wand around him because he keeps going off in the sensor thing and they get to his head and they it starts beeping and he just goes yeah i have a metal plate in my head and they're like okay move on and i asked yeah, him i was yeah. like I was like, do you actually have a metal plate in your head? He goes, no, I don't know what the hell they're talking about. I don't know why my head was beeping. I think your grandma <laughs> chipped me. And I'm like, oh, shit. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, you should, I mean, the coming, flying into uh, America is, I, I love America. I go there a lot, do a lot of work there. But you, you, I'm sure you know that for, for non-American citizens, especially getting into American security can be an absolute trial. And they want to know everything the sort of questions they come up, you know, some of which are very relevant. You know, you don't want to be letting anyone into your country. But some of the stuff they want to know from you at American you know, security, it's like, you know, what was your grandmother's middle name? Uh, who's the president of uh, Kazakhstan? Uh, what will you be doing uh, two weeks come Tuesday at 5 p.m.? It's really difficult stuff. There was um, a comedian I had on um, this podcast. He had a story about that he someone stole his passport and he was using his identity and the, they were he was trying to get like because he had a flight he had to go to and he couldn't travel they were holding him because they couldn't know if that was actually him or not so he had to call his mom to get his high school diploma and then get a <laughs> bunch of stuff from like grade school like a, a report card from like the third grade and all this stuff just wow. to confirm his identity and i'm like it makes sense based on what has happened that we still we have strict rules like that now but a lot of 
of the times it seems like much more of a hassle and I get it's for safety precautions and stuff, but it's like, it's hard to get in the mindset of like, let's just all pray we get through this flight and just make it to where we're supposed to go and then get on our yeah, way. Yeah. There's and a you whole know, like, constant fear. Back in the day, I mean, before hijackings and bombs and stuff, it was just, you know, okay. Flying was a little bit more unpleasant because there was a little bit more vibration and you know, it wasn't as smooth as it is today. But it was carefree, you know, it was carefree, glamour and elegance. And food was all a part of that, I think. You know, so you'd get less ways- hijackings if the food wasn't shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's some dude pissed off that they're out of the chicken and the fish and he gets a bag of peanuts. If it, you know, if yeah. it wasn't me that that happened to, if it was another person, they could have snapped. They're yeah, like, they That's it. I'm going to Liam Neeson yeah. this bitch and start yeah, pulling yeah. out guns. Could be like, Okay. Right, you're, you're trying my patience. No, you've got no chicken. You know that's really annoying. But when you said no fish, right? Sub this. I'm I'm taking this. That's what thing. snakes on the plane I, was created by. That dude released snakes because he got a fucking bad meal on an airplane, and he's like, "That's really? it. Every everybody's gonna suffer from anacondas." <laughs> Everyone has their uh, their breaking point, you know. Uh, so yeah, that I can imagine that sort of Michael Douglas, you know, falling down moment. You know, I've had it with airplane food. I'm taking all of you people to Kingdom Come with me. You know. Well, What do you think, I guess, would be a fix from talking to some stewardesses, talking to people in the flight industry? What would be a fix for the airplane industry? If if you want to focus on food, sure. But if there's anything else you think that should be changed, because I believe that pilot ego thing is a huge issue. I think that is a lot of power. I think that's a good reason why there's two of them there. If you're the only dude that controls a flight, it's like, hey. I am the fucking God here. And that's yeah. an issue, which I can see that can make sense. The pilot co-pilot thing, again, you know, again, to bring this, shamelessly bring this back to, to food and, my, and shamelessly plug my book on airline food once again. The whole thing, you, you know, you might hear this thing, think it's a myth that they have to have different meals when they fly. But it's actually true. I mean, one of the, one of the former flight attendants told me there was a famous, famous example, which they all knew in the industry. It was like this horror flight in 1971, Pan American, Copenhagen to JFK, and everybody had the shrimp cocktail, and everybody got severe, I mean, severe food poisoning. I mean, everything was an ad. We're talking, and again, I don't want to be too disgusting, but like, you can imagine what the toilets were like. A lot of people, most people didn't even make it to the toilet, so you're talking projectile vomit. Nearly everyone on the flight had the shrimp cocktail, and Pilot, i'm just the sitting there eating my peanuts like <laughs> you yeah, dumb exactly. motherfuckers you exactly <laughs> you, that's why you just gotta stick to the peanuts. and one one of the pilots had the shrimp cocktail and was severely ill but again because that's the regulation they can't have the same thing thankfully the other guy had had perhaps a, you know just a bag of peanuts or the chicken or something and he was fine he was able to deliver this quite disgustingly sickened flight down safely at JFK, where they were met with a fleet of ambulances. And, I and bet fire. you the airport was probably like, I don't even want you guys landing right now. Move it on yeah, to the next one. Get it, just, just go down to, yeah, get out of here. Yeah, you, just just think, land in Philadelphia or something. I think a rule maybe they should fix with TSA that might help with the airplane food industry is maybe people bringing their own food. Like my cousin's a diabetic. So even though that hour, extra hour hassle through TSA um, of why do you have these liquids? Why are there needles in your bag? Like I got pulled over at 3 a.m. by a TSA officer and he started just, like searching my shit. And I had my cousin's backpack on me who's a diabetic. And I'm mm. like, those, the, he's like, what are these needles? What are these juice boxes? What are these things? I'm like, oh, um, that's my cousin's. He's a diabetic. Why are you carrying your cousin's stuff? I don't know. We pick bags out of the car. We're more worried about getting to Vegas rather than focused on who's got the right proper bag. So you just package shit away. Maybe fix it so people can bring snacks on. Like my grandma always had a thing of like goldfish crackers or something if we wanted to munch yeah. on, you know, if, if people are able but to you bring can, You can little- do that. Can I think you can bring your, within reason, you can bring like your own sandwiches and pork, can't you? What's to stop some dude from bringing like ramen and be like, can you make me my ramen? Like there you go. It's all you got to do is <laughs> pop that thing in the microwave. It would make sense. Maybe you'd have less hostility if people complained about not getting fish on an airplane. Yeah. 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 I don't know what can fix the airline. Industry. Well, it's, I mean, I think, I think in general, we just expect these days, everyone wants something for nothing. Everyone just wants, and especially, you know, I know it's the same in America with, with, you know, internal flights. It's like in Europe, you know, if I'm going to go to Spain or something, I just want the cheapest possible 
flights, you know, and that's all I expect. And so I suppose that's the issue because unless you're spending top dollar and flying, you know, really good airlines these days like Singapore or Emirates or, or Turkish Airlines where you pay top dollar and you get amazing food, you know, most of us just want the cheap A to B experience. And maybe it's that kind of, I mean, in the way there's nothing wrong with that, but on, in another sense, it's like everyone wants something for nothing. And it has led to a kind of race to the bottom whereby a lot of standard, where, whereby I, airlines, have become, it's not just the security thing. I think it's the no frills thing has made flying quite unpleasant. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of cheapness basically. I think in the airline industry. I think one really good positive that they do focus on is around the holiday seasons. Like, let's say you're taking a flight on Christmas Day, they will do Christmas style food. They will do like turkey. They will do something like that. And I think that's very important because anybody that's ever had to work on a holiday, like I worked Thanksgiving. Um, this was a few years ago. I had worked on Thanksgiving and they served, it was fucking cold as shit out. They served cold soup. And I'm just like, where's the turkey? Where's the potatoes? Where's, it does, that little simple thing is such a mood booster when it comes to, it's the season. And around the holidays is where the most depression happens because a lot yeah, of people yeah. don't realize, like, imagine you're flying on business. You are alone in your life. You are, a, let's say you're a single business class man who's just flying back and forth every single day of their entire life. And mm. it's Christmas day and you're on a flight and somebody pulls out like Turkey or pulls out some Christmas cookies as a little gift to give you your fucking moods. And boosted. Just the little, the little things back in the day, they, Thanksgiving, it used to be, you can imagine lavish, you know, you would get your Turkey carved in front of you. You would get eggnog. You would get all the rest. You basically get your full roast dinner. Like you say, the spuds, all the rest, you know, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I imagine, hopefully, they still mark the season. I'm sure they do on most airlines in some way. I don't know if it's going to be quite as nice as having turkey, lovely, like, you know, carved. And they can't, this is the thing, post 9 11, they can't really have a lot of the same carving and serving implements that they once had, you know? So people are eating fun. fucking McDonald's. Why are they? That's what gets me. Oh my God. Why are people complaining about airplane food when they're eating McDonald's burgers? It's not, why do you care at this moment in your life that your flight from Kansas to Arkansas needs a steak on it? It doesn't make sense to me because people eat like shit in their everyday life. And those places like McDonald's and everything have great reviews and then also bad ones. And an airplane just has bad ones because you're not riding an airplane and you shouldn't be reviewing the food. It doesn't it's make because sense. We're, we're, it's because we're all suffering this. We're still suffering this like cultural nostalgic hangover from the golden age. So when you hear Frank Sinatra sing, come fly with me, come you know, fly released with in, me. Come yeah, fly released in 1950. And you think that and you think, wow, I can just imagine myself on the upper deck, you know, the double decker airlines, but upper deck cocktail lounge with old blue eyes, the glamour. You know, that was it, the glamour. And I think we're all suffering from this sort of nostalgic hangover of that idea of flying, which probably was never such a sweet reality ever. Bryce, we're going to put all our money together in a pile and we're going to split it. All right, me and you are going to design an airplane line, okay? Wow, okay. So what, what would we call it? That's what I'm saying. What would be the name of our airplane line? Will we call it... To the skies. I don't know. It's, it's got to. It's got to have something different than South. What the fuck is South? What, what is Delta? Why are you giving me all these code names? Give me something cool like Optimus. Optimus Airlines. Why don't we go for something like classical, like uh, you know, cla like sort of ancient Greece, like uh, you know, the heavens, like Zeus, Zeus Airlines. Zeus Airlines. Like no wait, Zeus. you'd have to do Apollo Airlines because that's Apollo. the that's that's yes. the sun god. Yes. Because that, yeah, and the, the idea of sky gods, we could do that. But we need to think seriously about this, Robbie. We need to think about color scheme. We need to think about all it would the have an orange, an orange tail. We have like a line of orange on the tail, and then on the wings there would be two orange lines on each side, and then it would be like a white base airplane. So it just has that little bit of pizzazz, not too flashy, but enough to where when the sun hits it, it gleams just perfectly matches like a beautiful sunrise. And then on the end, it could be like the sunset colors. So whether you're flying in the as a red eye in the morning or red eye at night, you got that nice little glow where that sun would hit it and it would make this excellent moment while you're in the sky right above the clouds. Yeah, yeah. And as we'd be coming into land, you know, the guys in the control tower be like, oh yeah, Z Zeus Air is coming into land. You know, clear the decks, lads. 
Clear the runway. Make some Zeus, motherfucking Zeus, room. Like, 752 is coming in. Yeah, yeah. Get out of the way. What? It, 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 it could turn into to Die Hard, though. Talking about Christmas movies, or just airlines and Christmas, you're just making me think of Die Which Die Hard is it with the Air Force? It die hard? It's the first Die Hard, isn't it? Yeah, with the Air Force and the terrorists. And, yeah, anyway, let's, let's get away from, from Die Hard. Yeah. Well, hold on a second. Then with the airplane, are we doing three seats in the middle, two seats on each side? Or are we doing like a small airline so people have, you know, room to walk? I want comfortability when I'm on an airplane. Nothing like being on a 12-hour flight to Hawaii watching Shark Tank and your knees just feel like they got <laughs> bubbles in them where you got to stand up. And the woman's like, sir, you can't be standing. It's like, I got to walk or I'm going to I'm gonna go back shit crazy. Well, look, they, they, you know, you fly um, Emirates, for example, today and, you know, your first class, you're, you're getting a shower and everything you know and back in the day again the big american character carriers like pan am the guy who found pan am juan trip he wanted to, he essentially he was a navy man right and he loves ocean liners and he really wanted like an ocean liner in the sky so he was he kept going to boeing you know the, the airplane manufacturers and saying can you make a plane that's like five or six stories high essentially like a flying hotel where you could amble around go to the cocktail bar you know go to the hot tub, you know, and then go downstairs and, you know, sleep. And, you know, you'd have like five or six stories, like, like a cruise line, right? And Boeing kept saying to him, we can't do this. because It's not safe because if you want to disembark people in an emergency, they can't be coming down like five flights, flights of stairs. This can't be the, like a flying Titanic. Yeah. So, they, so they, they have only ever allowed double-decker planes. That's, that's the maximum. But maybe Zeus Air could go the whole hog, screw safety, we just have like five or six or seven stories, like no, just no, no, a, fly, no. a flying hotel. We 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 got it. We got to keep it like a, like a, a economy size, like small size. But I don't want seats that are filled for like top rows first class. No 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 no. Every seat is the exact same. There's no special treatment if depending on how much you pay. That pay to play scheme is a bunch of bullshit in my opinion. I look and especially they let you board first and then like you're sitting there walking past all the people in first class and they're just looking at you while they're sipping mai tais like <laughs> peasants. I don't I don't like that. I want everyone to be at the same exact level so every one has no seat is different than another seat all the trays work everything okay. like that maybe one screen in the middle of each section so just so people can watch a movie you know and not play shark tank or something but like a good classic new movie something you would get on, on demand or something where everyone would actually be entertained mm. by it and definitely pro people first i think that's a big thing um, and if you want to correlate it to the gods factor, gods need the prayers of people. So it's like you please the people, then you in turn gain power. So if we keep the people pleased, we have already no complaints. And so we're, having, we're having no no class distinctions on our on Zeus Air. None. Yes. No first, no business, no economy. No, everyone's the same. Okay. Same okay. cards on the table. But what food would we serve? Because first class gets a bunch of crazy shit. That's why I'm saying everybody gets the same thing. But let's 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 take out the options of chicken and fish i want to i want to hit an avenue you want novelty i think a great novelty would look back in the day back in the more sexist age of the 70s a lot of the airlines started competing uh, and around around food service but it was like how can we get like the extra edge on our competitors and some airlines started you know getting going quite cheap and they're like let's put the flight attendants in hot pants okay so it's this kind of like sexualization of the flight attendant. Now, I don't think we want to go down that route. I think in terms of novelty, we've got to embrace new foods. And I mean insects, right? An insect-based cuisine on Zeus Air. And people will be like, wow, this is so novel. This is so cutting edge. This is so amazing. I had, I had a, a grasshopper burger on Zeus Air. I mean, that would be our, our unique selling point. You're just going to get people not wanting to eat on the flight. You're going to get a really pissed off entomologist that's going to be on there like, oh, my God, this was a spider from the second century that you put in this burger. I'm thinking like, let's do if it's breakfast time, if you're flying on a morning flight, let's do croissants. Let's do sausage biscuits. Let's do something where it's like if McDonald's can make you breakfast all fucking day, why can't we? Like, Well, the, the, but this is a problem. Like the back in the day, they would they would cook. In the air, they would serve up eggs. That was the, the main thing that they cooked in the air. Most of the other stuff is frozen, it's reheated in big ovens on the plane. But eggs for the first class gas passengers, they would always do from scratch. So you want, you, you know, you're, you, like you say, flying in the morning, you, everyone wants, you know, maybe your, your scrambled eggs or your poached, however you want your eggs done, they would cook them 
fresh, but that was incredibly taxing on the poor flight attendants. You imagine that's what I'm saying. We, we we just eggs get this flying everywhere. We get also this... altitude altitude makes eggs turn green, so you don't well, really want green scrambled. We eggs. get the sandwich rotisserie stuff, like when you walk into a gas station, the things on the rollers. Just grab one of those. People aren't going to care. They eat those anyway. It's like we're Pastries. just giving. Yeah, reason, but yeah, yeah. I, I want it to be easy on the workers too. Like nothing, it makes a flight more miserable than when the people that are supposed to be working on it are miserable. You're yeah. really going to have a bad crew. I want to make sure the audience is happy. And I also want to make sure that the people working there actually enjoy working there. I'm going to get to know the small crew. I want to know their birthdays. I want to make sure they get a Christmas card or a birthday card on their birthday. You know, I want to know them by name rather than know them by a number. Well, that was the thing. Again, that was... Uh... Pan American, you know, it was such a great airline because they treated people so well. They gave them proper culinary training. They they treated their people well, and they and they were eating good food, and they were trained in, in you know properly, and they were well paid for the time. Uh, yeah, you, you're right. You can always tell when people are treated badly at work because consequently, the customers treated badly. We've all been in that situation, haven't we? Where we're working like a bomb job, and you just you don't feel like good customer service. Either. You feel just like I just want to get through the day. I just want to get through this. And a big thing for me is put the bathrooms in the way back where it's like our whole tail section is like where there would be like maybe a couple rows of seats. Just take all the seats out and just put like four bathrooms back there. But so far back, that looks like, oh, I'm going to take a walk. So when because I've been on an airplane where they had a bathroom in the middle of the airplane, like dead center in the Mm -hmm. middle. So you had to walk through the aisle and then people see you go into the bathroom and then Mm -hmm. you're fucking taking a shit. And people, you're just thinking people are just counting the minutes I'm in here to see how long I'm going to be in here. That is so uncomfortable. It brings this uneasy feeling and you're walking back to your seat and people know what you did. So it's like I want the whole (laughs) back section to be like where it looks like you might go back there and we'll have like a little bar back there so people think hey maybe he's getting something from the bar maybe he's striking up a chat with somebody maybe he's we'll play put arcade game machine in there back there too like you would go to a bar so people are like maybe he's playing that you know so well, how about how about this i mean i know this is controversial but yeah the, 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 the toilets issue has always been you know something which has undermined the glamour of flying because they're amazing however, well however gla- but however glamorous your food is You've got to remember that there's vast, vast tanks of poo underneath you where you're sitting because that stuff all has to go somewhere. I'm not even worried about that, dude. I'm I'm happy with that toilet. You hit that flusher and it's like gets sucked into another universe. I wish I had that in my home. Have you ever worried though? Sometimes I've been on flights and maybe I've been, let's say perhaps maybe a little bit hungover or something. And you know that the, the extreme flush and you have that little moment of anxiety where you're like, I, is this going to suck me out of the plane? Bottom first. Is Hold it on gonna, a second. Am are I going to go flying arse first out of the plane here? Are you flushing while you're sitting down? No, but just as I stand up, maybe, yeah, as I stand up. But you, you have that little anxiety that you're just going to be sucked out into nothingness? No? No, I, my, I can't fit down the toilet hole, so I'm not too worried. If anything, maybe my... <laughs> If it's I'm like drunk affair. enough where my foot's in the toilet and I fucking do it, maybe, but <laughs> I, I enjoy watching it. I like throwing stuff down there like, hey, give me some car keys and you drop it in the toilet. It's like, where's that going? I'm like, I don't know. I think it just gets dropped out of the back of the airplane. Well, I'm saying this is what we, this is how we could differentiate you, Sarah. And you, people might think this is a little disgusting, but maybe have toilets on the seat, in the seats, built into your seats. No, No, I'm not going to be sitting, dude, my grandpa would be lighting it up. Like I'm sitting right next to him. Like I wanted the fucking leg room, but you're taking a shit in the middle. So it's really uncomfortable (laughs) for all of us. Well, we can make like little booths, so you wouldn't even have to, you know, be sitting next to people. You could actually have, I believe now they're they're in the age of COVID. Somebody thought, I don't know if this is true, but there's some airlines are starting to sort of rig up kind of plastic sheets between seats. So you're, you're, you're physically separated by a sort of plastic wall. At that point, wouldn't you just have to find a better way to get a COVID test to fix that? Because putting up like people in their own booths is just going to be so inexpensive. And I mean, I know the risk of COVID and all that, but like you're flying on an airplane, you kind of already accepted the risk. Like I work at a gym, Mm -hmm. so people all the time are like have to sign a waiver before working out. So they're like, you know, you're working, you're going to a place that's a higher risk of you getting that. So if you already know that, then don't be surprised if you get it, that whole style of thinking. I'm still sure. surprised yeah, you don't sure. like the Absolutely. whole getting sucked into the toilet thing. That is a new one for me. Just think about it. You know, I know it's irrational, but just the speed of that flush. Sometimes I'm like, wow, I, I'm, could, that, could that just drag me in? 
it's like you hear the horror stories of people who they, there actually have been a couple of terrible stories of you know when a plane uh, window the glass is gone and people have been sucked out i like the name apollo airlines i think we should roll back to that but okay. at the same okay. time with our pilot maybe instead of having a pilot come on the speaker and talk people down when they're experiencing turbulence, maybe what we do is we have someone that's a really good, like you ever been on a tour bus and the dude that's giving you the tours, like, and over here on your left, like doing this whole yeah, but the thing is that, that That's too panicked because he, he'd just be like, you know, no, I never, it's, it's kind of like, what you need is the really calm voice. Every, don't Get Morgan worry, Freeman. Everybody. Yeah, yeah, someone like that. Calm, calming, a godly, a godly, calming voice. That's what I'm saying. Everybody, uh, we are descending down into New Haven Port, Arkansas. Thank you for flying Air Apollo. Like something like that, where you're like, okay, it's calm. It's not rushing me up too much. But I feel like somebody who's a really good public speaker, that might be able to calm you down in mass hysteria. Because, I mean, absolutely. Yeah. I've had lightning hit our plane before. Really? That, what, that, what was that like? Fuck. That was something, dude. That's where like the airplane drops out of the sky and you're like, are we all going to die? Like the whole thing, lights went off and then like the whole thing was shaking like you were in an earthquake. I was mm. gripping the seat like, oh, this is it. But our pilot didn't say shit when it was over with. When everything, the lights came back on, you're like, whoa. And like the whole thing was falling, kind of came back up. You're like, what? what's what's going on? What's You're asking the stewardess what's going on. Pilot didn't say shit. Some pilot, don't don't bother anymore. You know, I like my pilot to be quite chatty. I like it to be. That's uh, what I'm I saying. Like it calms you down. And gentlemen, boys and girls, we're flying and now she's blah, blah, blah. on your left. You see the isthmus of Corinth. There's something like that. It's just calming. So some of them are great talkers. They love to tell you. You know, we're, we're flying over this landmark. We're going to be descending. We're, we're at this height. Some of them these days, Robbie, they can't be bothered. They don't say it. They don't say. It. Don't hear a peep out of them. That's the issue, I think, where it comes up with people just complaining about the food. You're just in a massive panic state when you're flying in the air. For even if people say, I'm so used to it. No, you're still, there's still that fear aspect. It's like whenever someone's like, I'm not religious, and then they get massively like ill, then they turn to God or something. You don't realize until you're at that point. And I think maybe that might be a fix is people would stop complaining more if we weren't just in this giant state of panic. So it seems like having someone or, to be able to comfort if, you there. Or if people were drunker, because um, obviously, you know, a, a drink in the air is worth a couple on the ground. And you do get drunk. And again, this you know, interviewing a lot of flight attendants, I feel really sorry for these women, the drunken, entitled assholes that they had to put up with all their life. Because again, you know, drinking to excess was always a part of commercial flying. Maybe if we just got our, our passengers more drunk than they'd be less anxious which was always the idea behind drinking yeah you know it just greg, conquers the anxiety i don't know if you know uh greg proops he's like a really funny comedian but he has a book called the smartest book in the world and he opens up about a lot of like crazy shit that we do but he has he talked about a story that he was on an airplane and his airplane had like just like hit some major turbulence and so why he's freaking out it was like for an hour and a half they're experiencing severe turbulence there was a famous singer in the back who took a xanax and went to sleep and after everyone was screaming and panicking about to cry thinking they're all going to die literally everybody on the plane was panicking even the flight guys um they landed and everyone's like, oh, my God, thank God. And she just wakes up like, all right, where are we going to? Like, just slept through the whole thing. I'm like, why is that acceptable yeah. that you can take a Xanax and you and you can't have a, you can't have a certain amount of alcohol without getting messed up? Well, that's the thing. I used to know someone who flew and she would take a Rehypnol, um, you know, a date rape drug every time on, when you're taxing to take off to just boof, knock you out because she was that scared. And. You know, I think you're right. People pretend that flying is the most normal thing in the world. There's nothing normal about hurtling through the air seven miles, you know, above terra firma. So if some people get through it that way, then fair play to them. I think a lot of people back in the day just, just got a bit drunk, especially when you had that sort of cocktail lounge area in the sort of upper bulge of the 747 where you could go and have a drink and a smoke and, you know, that, that, that kind of air and ambience of drunken excess, I think, was all part of it. I get the smoking, no smoking on an airplane, but maybe we should just change it and have a specific airplane that's designated for smoking, like how they're smoking mm -hmm. sections. We'll just create, instead of Apollo Airlines, we'll also do a spinoff of like Hades Airlines, where it's like 
Hades hailstorm, and then you're on that airplane is specifically designed for smokers. So it's like, you know, because it's that's the smoking airline. So if you have kids, you're not going to be able to get a ticket on there. That's just where people, business class men that are like, okay, I'm all right with smoking on an airplane. They have that one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that I think that's I love the brand of Hades, Hades hailstorm. Wow. It's for it's for the real men. But it's not, it sounds basically like you're going back to what flying was like in the in the 40s and 50s when it was basically just men and that's where the whole idea of the flight attendant comes from if you think about it that whole uniform that whole kind of thing is basically completely catered towards wealthy men who are smoking away drinking and want to see a pretty girl to come to, again that's the anxiety thing they want to see a pretty girl but they also want her to be a sort of housewife type mother who will constantly ply them with alcohol and food and that's where the you know let's face it very sexist kind of idea of the ideal air hostess comes from you know Talking to some of these women back in the day, my goodness, they had they they had to conform to that. You know, they were given weekly weight checks. Along yeah, the that's the weirdest thing is that you had to maintain a specific weight, and people are like, "What is that? Oh, is that just because the airline has to weigh a certain amount?" No, it's because they had an idea of what hot was like. It's like Hooters. When you go to Hooters, you're expecting a bunch of chicks and scantily. That's their whole thing. So it's basically a feminist's nightmare. Like you Absolutely, see, yeah, this... it, and it was. I mean, I, I was in the archives, and you find some of the hiring notes, which they clearly forgot to destroy when the company went bankrupt. And it's just, it's just so shallow and horrible that the hiring policy, you know, it really was. And uh, yeah, you had you had this weight check every week, and, and it went by heights. You know, if you there was basically a graph, and if you were a certain height, you could only be a maximum of a certain weight. And a lot of these girls would, would have to do things like you know, crash diet or, or hide their pregnancies and all kinds of stuff. Um, so it was pretty, yeah, it was pretty sexist back then. Um, There's a story I read about a woman that was throwing up like two hours before her flight was drinking laxative solution and trying to make herself puke and taking like enemas and stuff just to get down a couple pounds to be able to do her job. Like you hear about shit like that and you're like, wow, like every airplane I've ever been on, it's either been a very, very like stereotypical feminist stewardess, or it was a dude. And the dude was not skinny at all. He was overweight. And he was like, do you want any more cheese on your peanuts? I'm like, no. I well, don't back in the day, any- in, in the very earliest days, flight attendants were only male because they didn't think that women could cope with, with flying. Like, you know, that, that, that flying in itself was something that was just something too nerve wracking for women. So it's not until after the war into the 50s that you, that you actually get women becoming flight attendants for the, for the first 20, 30 years of flying. It was an all male. Dude, it goes school. back to the cornflakes thing. It's stupid freaking knowledge that it gets expired after 10 years. It's like back in the day when we banned sliced bread. Like that was the most fascinating to me was that we banned sliced bread in like the World War One or two, where it was because of the fact of how long it took to process slicing the bread before putting it into a package. It was like, this is a waste of time. We're wasting valuable time. And then so we just like banned that. So then people had to do it for themselves. And people were throwing a hissy fit over having to <laughs> slice their own bread. And it really gets me. You want to talk about a food that has a really strange history? Bread. Mm. Bread why the fuck does nobody eat the end piece? And you know why? It's because it doesn't look appetizing. That's bullshit. I think it tastes delicious and I don't care. If you're poor, you learn how to survive. I love the heel, as we call it here. The heel, I love the heel, especially toasted. I love the heel. You People know? throw it I away though because the they think it looks bad and they think it's going to be unappetizing. I'm like, dude, you're eating something that is literally drowned in A1 sauce or drowned in ketchup. So yeah, it doesn't yeah. make any sense. People like that, they look, I'm just going to say, uh, as joint chief executive, people like that have no place on Apollo Air. And there'll be a questionnaire before you board. If you're someone who throws away the heel of your bread, well, I'm sorry, we don't want your custom. That's the best motto for an airline I've ever heard. It's catchy. We don't take no heel and we don't want no heel. Yeah, it's pretty catchy, isn't it? Dude, this airline, I'm already like picturing like, what are our pricing options? Can we make it affordable, like 20 bucks a flight? Well, yeah, but then we're not going to be able to serve good food, are we? We could just get like a box of donuts. People love that shit. Okay, cheap comfort food. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
we don't have yeah. to make it so exotic where we have like five star chefs on it, but let's just make it to where it's like, hey, you're really here for the travel and good times. Not really worried about the food, but we're going to make it a comfortable experience just like you'd get at home. And how about we make a statement to, in case these sky gods, are try, in case these pilots think that every one of them is born to be Sully, let's make a statement. Let's pay the flight attendants more than our pilots. I like it. And if any of the pilots complain, we have a backup pilot on the plane, and then we just have that person get sucked into the toilet. Yeah, suck them. Just, so, or, if, or if we find anybody who's got on the plane who does actually throw away the heel of their bread, if that transpires during the flight, immediate march into the toilet, suck them away. That's the, well, first of all, that's got to be on the resume. You got to ask that question when you're doing the interview. I don't care about your flight experience, but I need to ask one question. Do you eat the end piece of your bread? No, that's disgusting. All right, you're not working on this airline. Should be on the, the customs declaration form. Yeah. <laughs> Just like a little survey at the bottom saying, make sure that you eat the last slice. We should have peanut butter and banana sandwiches as a snack on one of the plain things. Would you like to? Well, I have a peanut allergy. Then get the fuck off the airline. <laughs> I don't care. Just because Jim over there wants to enjoy oh, a man. peanut butter or banana we're, sandwich, you're telling me you're allergic. We're going to get saved, aren't we? We're going to get so badly Oh, no, just don't fly on our airplane. It's not that hard to ignore something if you don't like it, people. That's advice out there. Yeah. Oh, dear. Yeah. Well, you know, of all the ridiculous lawsuits involving food back in the day, the famous one, I actually met once one of the, one of the legal team from McDonald's. Who, there was the famous, famous incident where a woman sued it was in america of course she sued because she burnt herself on a mcdonald's coffee drink. that is not ridiculous actually why is that not ridiculous? if you look into that story it is not ridiculous at all what the media has played it as if because i actually followed and looked up that court case after that what um happened? what happened was is that they were serving the coffee at an extremely high temperature because they had actually overturned up the machine past the red line to brew coffee faster by using more heat. So when this elderly woman had gotten a coffee, someone, her passenger that was driving was, I guess her granddaughter or something had handed her a tray with the coffee thing or, and it didn't have, I guess the tray was broken or something and it spilled all over her hands and uh, legs and gave her like severe burns on burns. her hands. Yeah, but, but what, my, hold on, hold on. What the McDonald's did was they said that somebody was complaining and sued because of how hot the coffee was. And they fixed the headlines to say that. Uh, but if you follow the actual case, she wasn't suing them for money. She was suing them to pay for the hospital bill that she had to come up for from the injuries. She didn't See, want I, any I, money. I've been sucked in by McDonald's propaganda, haven't I? But all I'm saying is if, if, if people are going to successfully sue for that, which actually sounds quite legitimate now that you explain it, how and imagine the lawsuits when people are going to sue for the loss of their loved ones who've been sucked down a plain toilet into a, a cavern of poo because they cut the, they, they disposed of the heel of their bread. Like we're not going to have a, a leg to stand on. I mean, we're going to have to have some very good lawyers is all, is all I'm saying. All I'm saying is you just put it in the fine details that nobody ever reads, like terms and conditions. Uh, the small print, yeah. If you sit there and bitch and complain on our airline, you're getting sucked at, sucked through the toilet. I'm sorry. That's just what's going to happen. You just put that in the little details. But it's – see, that, 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 that case you brought up, though, that mentions something that's kind of important in my head is how – it's so crazy how corporate – places can manipulate headlines based on their influence to make it fit their description or fix their narrative that is mm. such a fucking big thing to me where it's like i read so much stuff now you don't know what's true and you don't know what's fake it's really hard nowadays and i'm like it'd be just easier for corporate and everything if people just stuck to their shit like if you know you're doing something wrong you get caught doing it don't try and hide it just own up to it own up to what you did you know you were doing this wrong you know it had a consequence nobody ever wants to pay the piper that's the craziest thing well nobody wants to do well this is the thing though is it's all about protecting the brand isn't it i mean that's why nobody wants to own up to stuff but you know and again researching pan am which was the second most recognizable american brand behind coca-cola i mean it was a famous famous american brand unfortunately and you know this is really sad the worst brand damage you can do uh, uh, you know, to yourself or, or have inflicted upon you as an airline is a crash. And, you know, that was really what did for Pan Am in the end. They, they had a really bad, well, they had a bomb explode uh, over Lockerbie in Scotland. Um, and, you know, that again, as well as being a tragedy, that's just really bad PR for the airline because then everyone thinks of that airline, they think of bomb. So again, you don't want to reduce human tragedies to capitalism and branding, but you can imagine as an airline, you know, 
a crash or any kind of safety incident is the absolute worst public relations, the absolute worst PR you can have. I definitely want want to fly on an airplane where they're like, we've had three successful flights. And you're like, how many flights have you done? It's like, <laughs> I've, we've done about 2000. It's like, you've only had three out of that 2000. You're batting three out of 2000 right now. They're like, yeah. And I'm like, well, at least you're honest about it. Maybe I would purchase a ticket. But then you get on, you, you, you know, there's some carriers who say we've never had a crash. And again, that whole final That's bullshit thinking makes me think, oh my goodness, this, this is going to be the fateful one. That's what I'm saying. When people say we've never had a crash, it's like going, to, have you ever looked up the skydiving incidences at a skydiving training place? You're oh, like, don't how, start on this one. Okay. how many well, accidents have you had? And like, we've had about four. And it's like, out of the whole time you've been in business? No, we have about four every year. And you're like, how many years have you been in business? And they're like, four. I'm like, so you've had like, 16 people die in the total of amount of time you've been open yeah it doesn't yeah. look good on your record it's not yeah 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 oh well there we go such is the modern world <laughs> air air apollo baby air apollo air Just apollo is the way for us stay <laughs> classy <laughs> now bryce please promote um your book man where people can find that at uh promote anything you want to um where people can find any of your links so i can put it oh, in the description it. That's very kind, uh, Robert. Yeah, look, the book is called Food and Aviation in the 20th Century, The Pan-American Ideal. And it's published by Bloomsbury, which is a publisher based out of, out of New York and out of London. So people just go online, they can find this book. Um, it's, it is a little bit highly priced because it's an academic book. This is the problem. Like Academic books tend to be higher priced than trade books, but I promise you it's a good read. And uh, it will change. You'll never think when you're sat on your... Apollo Air flight or whatever airline you choose to fly with, and you see that food in, on the tray table in front of you, I guarantee after reading this book, which goes to the entire history of airline food, you'll never think about it in the same way again. Can I um, give you maybe a suggestion of a book you should create? Please. Gods of the Sky, and you should focus on how the flight uh instructors how much like just how much assholes they are how much power they think they have focus on the ego part of that yeah there was a great there was a great story when i was researching this book again back in the 1960s one of these sky gods a lot of whom would have been combat veterans back then right so they would have they would have had experience in world war ii korea vietnam before going on to commercial aviation so they were sky gods and a half you know they were like i will do whatever i want to do and one of them's flying, I think it's JFK to London, and he decides he's just a bit tired, wants some breakfast. So he just calls an unscheduled stop. He plunks the plane down in, in Shannon in Ireland, which is just completely unscheduled stop, makes up an excuse to the passengers, I'm oh, sorry, we've got engine trouble, jumps off the plane for an hour, gets a really nice Irish breakfast with rashes and sausages and eggs and lovely cup of tea and all the rest, gets back on after an hour. Oh, that's all fixed now and then continues the journey. I mean, the arrogance is astounding, but there's something about that. There's also a certain sort of, how would you put it, patrician charm to that level of ego, perhaps. I'll bring it right back to what my grandfather said. Just because you're a veteran and you have that title doesn't give you the right to be an asshole. True, true. My yeah. grandfather was a veteran, and let me tell you something, I've never seen a man talk about it less in his whole entire life. He doesn't, well, he doesn't wear the hat, doesn't wear the uniform out in public, even though it's 80 years past due. He's just like, no, I know what I did for this country. And I'm like, you're fucking mystical, man. Like you tossed me out advice in some of the toughest moments of my life. That doesn't make sense, but I can see your point. Well, it's refreshing to hear because a lot of people can't stop in this country as well, just cannot stop talking about the fact that they are, which again, it's, this is the thing with everything, isn't it? In history, it's, it tends to be heavily nostalgized and rose tinted. And if people were, were actually honest about how a boring or b scary a lot of their life experiences were, you know, maybe we'd be a better as humanity instead of nostalgizing every little thing. Well, it's a, trying to capture the past and to quote him again, you know, you can't move on to the future if you keep holding on to the past. So, I mean, I look at that, I'm like, yeah, we're definitely not here to forget what happened in the past. It's good to remember, but it's also good to try and find a way of moving forward and never repeating your own mistakes. Absolutely. Yeah, let's, let's, I say this as a historian, let's forget the past and just move on. 
apart from my book, everyone should read my book. Um, but apart from that, yeah, forget the past. I'm down with that. I'll read a book. I've read okay. maybe like three my whole entire life. You could be the fourth. <laughs> Good man. <laughs>